Hello, hello, and welcome everyone to the Evergreen State College Art Lecture Series. I'm Miranda Malis. I use she, her pronouns. I teach at Evergreen and I um, want to welcome you to our series. Our series presents a broad range of interdisciplinary approaches to contemporary art issues by artists, writers, activists, and scholars. Our ongoing aim is to bring an array of practices and practitioners from a variety of fields, areas of inquiry, and creative production active in the world beyond campus. The series provides a lively forum for the exchange of ideas between the speakers, students, faculty, staff, and the public. This quarter, this series has an ecological emphasis. We're bringing practitioners to the college who in various ways through various genres, modalities, from journalism to cinema, performance and poetry, communicate deeply with a range of publics about intertwined issues concerning climate change and ecology and related phenomena and challenge. So week two, we had Daniel Harm immersing us in the eco arts. In week six, May 4th, we're honored to welcome Washington State Poet Laureate Rena Priest. Week eight, May 18th, we will be welcoming eco-poet and painter Roberto Harrison. And this week, we are very delighted to welcome local Seattle Times environmental journalist and author Linda Mapes. The introducer and interlocutor for Linda today is our own professor Zoltan Grossman. Zoltan is a professor of geography and native studies at Evergreen and the author of Unlikely Alliances, Native Nations and White Communities Joined to Defend Rural Lands, and co-editor of Asserting Native Resilience, Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Face the Climate Crisis, among other texts. Welcome, Sultan, and thank you for being here, Linda. Thank you, Miranda. I'd like to introduce Linda V. Mapes, the incomparable Seattle Times staff reporter who specializes in coverage of the environment and indigenous cultures and governments. Over the course of her career, she's won numerous awards, including twice the International Kavli Gold Award for Science Journalism from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest professional science association. She's written six books, including Orca, Shared Waters, Shared Home, about the Southern resident orcas and their struggle to survive. It's the winner of the 2021 National Outdoor Book Award. Uh, yet another book is Elwa, A River Reborn, about the largest dam removal project ever in history and the effort to revive a wilderness watershed in Olympic National Park and its once legendary salmon runs. And a related book, Breaking Ground, about the lower Elwa Klallam tribe and the unearthing of its Sewitson village in Port Angeles. In 2013-14, Linda was awarded a Knight Fellowship in Science Journalism at MIT. In 2014-15, she was a Bullard Fellow at the Harvard Forest, where she's an associate, exploring the human and natural history of a single 100-year-old oak to write Witness Tree, published by the University of Washington Press in 2019. She was recognized by NOAA Fisheries in 2016 with the prestigious Dr. Nancy Foster Habitat Conservation Award for her reporting on fish and habitat. She's just been selected as a Bullard Fellow again for the upcoming academic year to write her new book about the importance of old growth forests to indigenous ecology and cultures and the survival of our planet. From my point of view, Linda is one of only a tiny handful of daily newspaper reporters who consistently cover indigenous environmental concerns and the land back movement. She writes in a sophisticated and nuanced way that takes tribal sovereignty and treaty rights as givens and respects the authority of tribes to project their power back into the watershed and estuaries of their original ancestral homelands. When I sometimes start reading a fantastic article on the back pages of the Seattle Times, I'm never surprised to turn back to the front page and see her familiar byline. I'm also never surprised to see her at a Lummi gathering for orcas or a Puyallup rally against a fracked uh, gas tank, and then read the next day that she let the tribal leaders tell their own stories. When our Conceptualizing Play students last year produced the online book, Removing Barriers, Restoring Salmon Watersheds Through Tribal Alliances, 
They cited Linda's articles on dam removals so often that we had to train them in APA bibliographic style for an author's multiple articles in the same year, MAPES 2020A, MAPES 2020B, MAPES 2020C, and so on. Her body of work is one reason that Washington's non-Native public is so much better informed on tribal, environmental, and climate concerns than readers anywhere else in the country. It's no accident that the president is marking Earth Day on Friday in Seattle. Linda Mapes is a vital resource for our region and a treasure for scholars and activists who are seeking to find what they can do to save the salmon, the orcas, the trees, and ourselves. Linda, welcome to your natural habitat of the Evergreen State College. Well, that's just such a warm and lovely introduction. I'm going to save that for my next crummy Monday morning. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And I would just like to say I'm very uh, grateful to Evergreen and the work that you do, Zoltan, and so many other educators um, at Evergreen. It's a very special institution, and it always has been, and it, it plays a very, very critical role in shaping and educating the next generation of leaders in Washington state, and also a place of spiritual renewal and refreshment for all of us in your community. Um, so thank you for inviting me to join you today. I'm, I'm delighted. We had a little pre-conversation today, I'll tell you in the audience. I said, you know, everyone's so sick of PowerPoints and slide decks. I, I don't think I could even stand it myself. <laughs> so we decided what we wanted to do today was have a conversation uh, with you and with one another. So I want you all to feel very invited to jump in and ask us anything. I'm here for you. This time is yours. You can ask me anything about journalism, about writing, about issues, um, whatever you want to discuss. That's what we're here for. So uh, without further ado, I, I think what we want to do is just kick off this conversation. We've got some time together to share about some of the crucial issues here in the Salish Sea and beyond. Uh, we, we kind of pulled out three general topic areas that we want to talk about. One is uh, legacy forests and the emerging changing conversation about trees forest management in our region. I've been covering uh, trees and forests and logging and forestry in our region since the 90s. And it, it is a conversation that's changed and changing even dramatically. So I would love to talk with you about that. Um, another thing I would like to talk about is Southern resident killer whales, orcas. And, you know, we, we look at this matriarchal society that's, that's been here in our region for 10,000 years. And there's a lot we can learn about our own lives here from them. They, they can teach us what sustainability really looks like and what sustainability will have to look like. if We're going to continue to have the orcas in our midst. And the third kind of idea cluster I'd like to talk about is uh, dam removal and how that conversation is changing from, you know, being kind of a renegade conversation about, you know, tearing stuff down to a community building conversation about how we look at these legacy investments all over the landscape that have outrun their useful life and um, not only aren't serving the original purpose, but are even undermining other things we care about and how communities are coming together um, in conversation about, you know, what can we do that better positions us for the future, for biodiversity, uh, for species preservation, uh, and, and just a new fresh look at the true costs and benefits of some of the legacy infrastructure that's out there on the landscape. This conversation has been really transformed by the success of dam removal in the Elwha. So those are three general areas that I wanna lift up for us to reflect on and talk about today. And I invite you if you wanna bring in other topics, but that's kind of what Sultan and I thought we might uh, talk about. So we can start anywhere you want. What do you think, Sultan? Where do you wanna start? Well, uh, just to let people know, too, they can uh, look at the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and formulate any kind of written question for me to uh, read off. may not re read it off at the exact moment, uh, but kind of insert it into the conversation. You can also use the raise hand function if you want to verbalize and kind of join in the verbal conversation, just as if we're in a normal room. Um, I guess let's start with uh, with dam removal, because okay. in terms of your work, that's uh, where I first began to notice it. And I think people, 
now that the Elwood Dam removal is uh, quite a ways in the past, mm -hmm. I think people think of it as something that that happened, an event, not a structure. And uh, it's just so indicative of um, of healing the damage, of reversing the damage mm -hmm. uh, wrought by settler colonialism mm -hmm. uh, on our ecosystems, on the indigenous nations. I'm wondering if you can um, spell out some of the uh, results that you have been following very closely um, of the uh, restoration of that watershed and what lessons are in there perhaps for the larger scale dam removals being contemplated on the Snake River in particular, but other uh, larger ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest. Sure. I, I'm, I think I want to start with lessons because uh, people often ask me what, what's the most important thing that we should all take from the Elwha experience. And I, I would say the first thing is hope. We live in a time when uh, there's a lot of sense of despair. Nothing changes. Nothing can get better. People can't agree on anything. Um, I know I sometimes feel that way, but, you know, rivers don't lie and neither do fish and you can count them. <laughs> it's only been 10 years and we see this remarkable uh, surging back of species of all kinds to the Elwha watershed. This is a watershed scale recovery from the mountains to the sea. And, you know, whether you want to talk about Chinook that are now back in numbers not seen in a generation or summer steelhead, which were really completely extirpated and now are in the best populations anywhere on the west side of the Olympic Peninsula. Or you want to talk about dippers, a songbird, obligate to the to the Elwha that are now so big, so fat, so sassy, they're actually bearing double clutches of young. Why? Because they have salmon eggs to eat again. Or maybe you want to talk about the near shore where we have Washington's newest beach. We've gone from a place of bare, eroded cobble, really kind of a dead zone, because of all that beautiful soft sediment uh, being locked up behind the dams, to an incredible soft sandy beach that has actually become a staging ground for an entire nearshore recovery. We now have 15 feet deep soft sand offshore of the Ola. There's a crab fishery out there again for tribal fishers for the first time in a generation. You see a whole reset of the Ilwa watershed, truly from the mountains to the sea, because of taking out these two dams and allowing the river to do what rivers do, which is constantly move big wood and sediment down the watershed, creating the complexity, the braided side channels, plunge pools, and all the rest that salmon need. And as salmon come back, they feed some 123 species of vertebrate life and they feed the soil. There's salmon in the trees, there's salmon in the soil. And so to me, the message of the Elwha is change is possible. And not only that, but we made this change as a community. This all came out of the Elwha Fisheries Restoration Act, which was passed in 1992 by Congress and backed by $350 million in public funds. So this wasn't just a one-off and it wasn't just um, one super engaged indigenous nation, uh, although that was the key starting point for it all. It was something that we came together as a country to do and have sustained um, with a very, very deep investment of stewardship by the Lower Elwha Kalawam tribe, which has forborne uh, utilizing their treaty rights now for more than 10 years in order to help uh, uplift this recovery. That's a huge sacrifice. Um, scientists started charting the recovery of the Oa before dam removal, setting a baseline of what conditions were so that all of us for all time can see what it was like before and what it's going to look like as recovery progresses. So there's been a huge scientific investment. There's been a huge investment by NGOs from around the region and even around the world in tracking and telling the Elwha story. So, you know, what, what the Elwha tells me, what the lessons of the Elwha are, is change is possible. And when it, when it is made, it can work. <laughs> you know, it, it works. I think that's really important. People can feel very um, depressed about, you know, whether we can make change or whether if we make change, it can actually move the needle. And my answer to both of those is yes and yes. And change can and should happen, not only at the individual level, but at the society and policy level. That's where the really big 
investments and reinvestments can and should be made. And when we make those changes, uh, they can really work. Well, thank you so much. And we have a few um, related questions on, okay. uh, on dam removal from Alyssa McLean. Can we talk about what it takes to restore a river and remove a dam? What is the process? Where do you start? From Don Chalmers, to what degree did the Elwell removal depend on the shifting economics of those dams that brought consensus to remove? And from Re uh, Revi Aljagian, I would love to hear your thoughts about the discussion surrounding Capitol Lake and the proposed removal mm -hmm. of the Fifth Avenue Dam here in Olympia. Yeah. Uh, what are the attitudes surrounding this? Are indigenous voices being heard? Right. Well, let's start with economics. Um, I'm really glad this question came up. What was really interesting about the Elwha process was that when the Elwha Act passed, it was in the middle of the night. This was kind of a stealthy maneuver by proponents of dam removal. And if you read my book, Elwha River Reborn, which is in any library, um, you'll see that this was a very deliberate political strategy. Uh, Norm Dix, the congressman then at the time, so, you know, I don't want anybody to make any floor speeches. It's like midnight last night of the session. Let's just throw this um, into the hopper and pass it and we'll deal with it later. Well, deal with it later was kind of ugly, honestly, because the Port Angeles community woke up the next morning and said, what? <laughs> because the way really hadn't been paved for a broader community consensus. And so there was a big backtrack and Here's what that looked like. Uh, Trout Unlimited worked to convene a, a study group of citizens from the Port Angeles area, from all walks of life, who really hadn't been involved in this question, and that was deliberate. And they proceeded to do an education about, okay, here's the situation. You have a dam that's owned by Crown Zeller Rock that uh, doesn't meet modern environmental standards, that can't get a license from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission without major overhaul and big investment to bring it up to modern environmental standards. Um, you've got one dam that was actually built in what is today the National Park boundary without any permission from Congress, which just straight up breaks the law. You've got dams that are just downright dangerous, according to Corps of Engineers readings, that could flood out the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe. You have dams that are breaking the treaty rights uh, for the sovereign tribe of this place. So put it all together, you have two basically deadbeat dams. Furthermore, the jobs of the mill, which is powered by the Elwha, uh, private power, are incredibly valuable to this community. These are family wage manufacturing jobs. And we can replace that power today from the Bonneville grid. So the jobs can continue. There's replacement power still at bargain basement rates from the Bonneville grid. And here's the federal government willing to buy these dams, take them off uh, Crown Z's hands and put public dollars into rebuilding this watershed, bringing back the salmon, keeping the jobs. And not only that, but guaranteeing without any cost sharing uh, that the city of Port Angeles will have as good a water quality as before they take their drinking water from the Ola River. And we'll even build um, specialized equipment to make sure that the extremely high water quality needed for paper processing at the mill will also be protected. What a deal. Really, honestly, what a sweetheart deal. We'll, we'll probably never see anything like that again. But once the community... Uh, group that was convened to hear this uh, thought it through and looked at the cost and the benefits. They were on board, more than on board. They were demanding that Elwha dam removal happen for the preservation of the larger community for the jobs um, and to take these uh, deadbeat dams off the hands of the community. Because without this Elwha Restoration Act, without this federal reinvestment in this watershed, there were, there were going to be some pretty serious job losses. There were going to be ongoing treaty rights violations. There were going to be ongoing environmental violations. So there really was no other answer than dam removal. And so this was a real turning point for the region in the sense that this cost-benefit analysis was a community process. And honestly, one of the other real benefits of the Elwha is the example of that process, that people could rationally look at a situation and make a decision as a community that actually 
Diary removal here is better for us. This is a community problem solving tool. And we're seeing this more and more around the region. You know, a lot of dams have come down since then. Condit Dam came down on the White Salmon, also owned by Pacific Core, a private owner. Same situation. This is a dam built in the early 1900s, blocking fish passage, um, violating treaty rights. Pacific Core couldn't get a license from FERC, made the same calculus and said, we're going to blow it up. And they did. A lot of people have watched that video many times. <laughs> and here comes another big dam removal on the Klamath. That's going to be the largest dam removal ever in the world, four dams, beginning in 2023, coming out on the Klamath, which winds from the desert country of Oregon all the way to Northern California to the sea. And again, it's because of economics. These are privately owned, can't get that FERC license. Tribes from the watersheds up and down that river have come together and worked with NGOs and community leaders to put together a dam removal uh, proposition, which Pacific Corps has endorsed. And when Congress couldn't get it done, they said, okay, that's all right. These are privately owned dams. We'll just do it ourselves. And they created a, a separate freestanding um, committee to get the work done. And it's starting very soon. So this process, this community problem solving process is being replicated all over the country and all over Washington with older infrastructure. Some smaller scale examples um, in Whatcom County and Bellingham, they used to get their drinking water via a diversion of the Nooksack River. Like a hundred years ago, that's when they started doing that. And once again, we have a story of a piece of infrastructure it's falling apart, it's gonna need some expensive repairs. The city of Bellingham uh, got together with the Tulalip tribes and American Rivers, and did some analysis of, well, you know, what, what, what about taking it out? We can just get water from the city of Snohomish. We don't need to do this at all. We can just like buy water. It would actually be cheaper uh, to partner up with the city of Snohomish and just be, you know, another customer for them. And that is exactly what they did. And they took out that dam on the Nooksack River and opened it up to Chinook Passage for the first time in 100 years. So, you know, this is this transition from dam removal, seem, seeming like this like renegade hippie action to actually being a, a community problem solving tool undertaken by uh, everything from water plant managers to um, fisheries managers at tribes to say, you know, hundred years in, maybe we've got some other priorities and maybe we have some new tools in which to do this better and do it right. So change is possible and community process has, has uh, really come a long way since the first early days of the ELWA when people thought dam removal was crazy and the number of people who thought it ever could or should happen, you could fit in a Volkswagen. <laughs> uh, that's not how it is anymore. This has become, um, it's a thing. And it's going to keep being a thing because a lot of these dams have outlived their useful life and people have to come up with solutions. Some of them aren't safe. Some of them don't do anything for anybody anymore. Good example of that. They got the Enlo Dam sitting out there in the middle of central Washington blocking steelhead uh, migration across the border. I don't know. It's like a hundred miles of salmon habitat. You know, the last time that thing made a kilowatt was in like, like 50 years ago. It, doesn't do anything for anybody. It just sits there, full passage blockage. So the Okanagan PUD, which has, you know, very little money, is trying to figure out, well, what in the world do we do with this thing? I, I think my favorite quote was from one of the PUD commissioners. So I used to say I'd sell it for a nickel, now I'm down to a penny. <laughs> but it's complicated. What do you do with the sediment? It, it's being tested by USGS and determined that there's some mining uh, waste in there. So you know, none of the, I don't mean to say that these things are simple, but they are solvable. And speaking of uh, dams that haven't produced any kilowatts ever, the Fifth Avenue Dam here in Olympia uh, seems uh, somewhat closer to removal and that uh, the possibility of uh, Capitol Lake being drained and restoring the Deschutes estuary is now uh, looking plausible. And what are your um, uh, thoughts on this and on the role of the Squaxin Island tribe, Nisqually tribe in helping to make this happen? These two tribes are two of the most sophisticated um, in our region in terms of their fisheries expertise, in terms of their um, economic capacity, and in terms of their 
ability to speak of and stand up for their cultural teachings. And, you know, we look at, at Nisqually, Billy Frank Jr., the, the chairman out there. Willie Frank is, of course, the son of Billy Frank Jr. And so he carries a certain weight and mantle not only in Indian country, but in our region as a spokesman for the salmon and what they mean to all of us and to our ability to persist as Northwesterners into the future. So at Squaxin, you also have a very sophisticated um, team of managers there and spokespeople for the salmon and for our region. And so you couldn't have better partners to lead the healing of this place, speak for it, speak of the how and the why. And I think that, you know, this is the capital city of the state of Washington. Salmon passage has been required by law since Washington was a territory. You can look it up yourself in some of those beautiful leather bound books in the archives, steps from the Capitol Dam. You know, that salmon are not to be blocked anywhere. They are wont to ascend is the wording. So you tell me how it is that, that thing sits there all this time later. You know, it's not pretty. People may think it's a pretty little reflecting pool for the capital, but again, changing values, changing times. And I, I think this ought to be a, a poster child for the state and its commitment to the salmon and to an estuarine ecology. What is one of the most critical ecologies for salmon restoration. It is that estuary where they do miraculous things. These salmon get ready to, to change internally from freshwater beings to saltwater beings or the other way around when they're coming back. I mean, the estuary is where it all happens in terms of resting, staging, feeding. The loss of estuarine, estuarine habitat in Washington's near shore waters is tragic. Here in the, where I am, in the Salish Sea territory of Elliott Bay and beyond, it's almost 100%. So, you know, Capitol Lake, <laughs> I got Capitol Estuary. I don't know, got, got a nice ring to it. But this is not going to go away. It's been talked about for years. Um, my only question is what's taking so long. And I'm very interested to see how momentum starts to build. We also have a question, related question from Kara Briggs, um, our Vice President of Tribal Relations, Arts and Cultures. Um, are we going to see the removal of dams on the Skagit River in the treaty ceded homelands of the Sox Weattle tribe and downriver the homelands of the upper Skagit? These dams are owned by Seattle City Light, which has been shown to have decimated the once vibrant salmon runs on the Skagit for over a century. Uh, Seattle residents directly benefit from the electricity generated on the Skagit, the crisis in their own backyard, but they're more likely to know about dam removal on the snake. How do we get this great environmental city to be accountable to the damage that's done on the Skagit River? Who's responsible who can stand up for the Skagit? Big shout out to Kara, former colleague of mine at the Spokesman Review a thousand years ago. Um, Kara's a former journalist herself, and you can tell in that question how beautifully she states it. You know, this is a fascinating, uh, conversation in Seattle that I'm, I have to say I'm enjoying because Seattle likes to uh, poke at others all over the region saying they ought to do this and they ought to do that, uh, including the lower Snake River dams that they ought to come down. Meanwhile, here they sit on these dams on the schedule with no fish passage. Wow. I was kind of surprised when I learned that. I mean, I actually, full stop, I was very surprised in this day and age. Uh, the other thing that surprised me, honestly, was these dams don't make as much power as you might think. Uh, they're not the only dams that generate power for city light. They also have some very large dams over on the eastern side of the state, in Andre. And it, it it's not a open and shut case that uh, these dams are going to continue to sit there either at all or without fish passage. And where we are in the process now is a relicensing process under the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. This is a really good process. It forces communities and uh, government agencies and actors and NGOs and tribes to come together and really look at a facility and say, okay, you know, is this thing cutting it anymore? And if it isn't, this is what we're going to require you to do. And the, the emphasis here is on the word require. 
It's not, let's make a deal time. It's not, well, what would be easy for you? Or what could you accommodate? It's, this is what we are going to require. And then it's really up to Seattle City Light to call the question, oh, well, we can't afford that. Or, oh, that's too much. Or, you know, whatever the heck they might say. They might say, yeah, you're right. Anything could happen. But the point is, you have a third party here that has very um, large power to say, after all the analysis is in, all the assessments are in, this is what you must do. And then it's up to Seattle City, right? And, and their late rate payers to call the question. This is still today one of the most progressive uh, places in our state. Um, and it'll be very interesting to me to see how rate payers come together around this. There's been a lot of support for tribal treaty rights uh, for the tribes that have, uh, as unfortunately and as usual, uh, been the ones who have suffered the loss of the salmon for the development and wealth of this region. It's the same um, unbalanced equation we see all over our region because a lot of these facilities were built back in the day uh, without any consultation, of course, without any consideration of the native people and ecologies that were here. It was just, let's go make kilowatts. Well, that's not today and that's not now. And most of the people in Seattle have made very clear that they take seriously tribal treaty rights and they value a living ecology on the schedule, which is, as Kara points out, you know, one of the most valuable salmon producers um, we have left. And in Puget Sound, it's the number one producer, the biggest source of fresh water. This isn't just any river, this is the Skagit River. So early days, lots of process ahead, but you know, what, what we will see there, you know, I, I think it's a very open question. And as you've mentioned, uh, there's so much involved in dam removal, whether it's dealing with the sediments that are going to come down. Susan Holcroft is mentioning about the cleaning up the invasive species mm -hmm. in Capitol Lake. Um, mm -hmm. There's so much, not only technical, but kind of um, uh, cultural, social decisions on, on what's going to be prioritized, economic decisions. And so it seems to be an inflection point of which direction <clears throat> a community, a watershed is going to go in. Um, and so I, I really hope Evergreen students get involved, whether it's the uh, Deschutes estuary, if there's dam removal, the snake or Klamath removals, the possibility of the Chehalis Basin project preventing a dam and instead having other types of flood control um, that are more holistic and ecosystem oriented. I think that there's a lot of opportunities for Evergreen staff, faculty, students to get involved in some of these, these efforts. I agree. I, I do want to call out the Chehalis. This, this is right in your backyard. This is a really important Chinook producer of tribal treaty rights held there by two, two tribal nations, Quinault Chehalis. Look, I mean, the idea that we're actually talking about building another dam uh, in this day and age, it, and I think that, you know, the, the case being made for this dam is flood control, but flood control for how many people and at what cost of everything else? And they say, oh, well, it's just a temporary dam. It goes up and down depending on the water conditions. Well, obviously, you still have to cut all the trees in the watershed. Obviously, it still affects everything within the basin of what becomes a reservoir. And so... This has been a very hard fought, quiet little fight, and uh, it could use a lot more attention. Uh, there's been a whole re-rack of the consideration. Governor Inslee has actually stuck his shovel into this one a couple of times and said, actually, I really want you to come up with some non-dam alternatives in the shift. It was kind of resetting the conversation. Those are some important moments. Um, this is an under-noticed battle and it is right there in your watershed and it's a very important battle mostly because once again it's it's a conversation about the process who gets included and who doesn't who counts and who doesn't how do we do the analysis um how does the community really come together and look at it holistically instead of at just one need flooding is serious in the Chehalis there's no doubt about that you know I-5 takes a bath every couple of years but why is that it's a bigger question than just damming the river. It's also floodplain management. I mean, a lot of that floodplain has either been heavily logged and forests, as we know, mitigate flood water by absorbing it, holding the soil. Um, furthermore, there's been a lot of development in the floodplain because 
that's how local governments make money, building big box stores and all the rest. Well, that's just like putting rocks in a bathtub. You take up that space, water's going to have to go somewhere. And what it does is it spreads out and it floods. So, you know, it's it's more complex than just damn it and walk away. It's, it's, it's much more complex than that in terms of the effects on the watershed if you do that. And secondly, what's driving the flooding in the first place? You know, what about forestry practices? What about development? And how do you make it fair? You know, this equity question is very important. You know, King County got rich, completely destroying the Duwamish green watershed. Basically, now it's the second largest warehouse hub on the West Coast. Where are those warehouses? Well, they're all along the banks of what was one of the most important salmon rivers in the United States. <clears throat> and that was after we took out the Black River by building the Ballard Locks. So, you know, we got rich, made a lot of prosperity here by destroying uh, this river of central Puget Sound. Well, what about places like Chehalis and, and the rural counties down there? How the, if, we're, if they're not going to make their money with development on the floodplain like we already did in King County, how do you make that equitable? And that's a question that we see time and time again as we look at climate change, as we look at dam removal. How do you make it as we look at forestry? You know, what do you do about rural economies that are, that are making this transition from the way we used to do things to the way we're going to have to do things. And that fairness point is something I charge you all with looking into and looking at what, what are the equity equations that can make these rebalancings work out in ways that are truly sustainable. You know, these can't be hostile takeovers. Those won't be lasting recoveries or enduring solutions for communities. It's, it's have to be community-based solutions in which everyone can see the sense of the steps that are taken, even the necessity. And it's so inspiring seeing the leading role of the tribes in mm. coming up with some of these creative solutions right. and studying um, possible options for the Chehalis Basin. Um, some of our students were looking at the Tulalip Tribes uh, Beaver Project and mm. reintroducing beaver to the upper reaches of the Snohomish Basin to capture some of that meltwater and the upper reaches of the watershed so it doesn't um, result in spring floods and release it during some of the summer low flows that are also challenging uh, to salmon. The, there's just so many creative things going on out there that we really haven't heard about and um, that one watershed can teach another. That's well said. And I love the beaver piece. I mean, you just think about what this place was like not that long ago. I mean, like 150 years ago, it's a blink. It's a blink. Um, and and where, where we can bring back these little eco-engineers <laughs> um, and bring back the, the native uh, resilience of this ecology. I mean, it was all working fine until we showed up. So you got to ask yourself, where, where can we reset those abilities so that they can these natural processes can resume? It's not like we need to do it. We just let need to let these natural processes do what they already brilliantly did in redistributing nutrients, managing floods, um, nourishing species, nourishing us. Well, before we go on to uh, talk about salmon and orcas, I want to take a step back because I think some uh, students might be joining this conversation inspired by your journalism in particular. And Don Chalmers asks, uh, what originally brought you to this work? Hmm. And uh, Kara Briggs, uh, past president of the National uh, Native American Journalists Association, um, asks, as wonderful as the work you do and have done over many years, how can we increase and retain the numbers of Native journalists, specifically those from tribes in Washington State and the ranks of daily newspapers yeah. in the state? Because it's also important that they be able to tell their own stories, even in this time of economic challenges, reshaping newspapers. Here, here. Yeah, I mean, Kara, I, I feel you. That This was a hard one for me. We recently had an opening on the environmental team and I reached out to um, friends around Indian country and said, you know, SOS, help. We, how, how, how can we get someone on the team uh, from Native Nations? And uh, I was saddened that that didn't result in a recruitment. And, you know, all I can say is, is the whole heart wish is there. Um, we need, I, I guess I would turn it around and ask you, what, what can we do to do a better job of that? What, what conferences do we need to go out and raise the roof? What 
what earlier stage development do we need to be doing in journalism programs? Um, I take this serious. I, I, I care about it enormously. I couldn't agree more. And uh, we need to make it happen. This is a, a newspaper that is the largest paper outside of the Los Angeles Times, <clears throat> covering issues all over the Pacific Northwest. And those voices absolutely have to be the narrators. So I guess I would turn it around and, you know, maybe you and I should do some one-on-one -on -one about how can I help the editors at the Seattle Times do that job better? Because each one of these positions matters and we're hiring like crazy. I mean, seriously, it, it's a, we are hiring a lot and filling a lot of different kinds of positions with the paper right now. And every time that doesn't happen, it uh, kind of takes a little chunk out of my soul. So with you on that. And, you know, as to what brought me to the work, <laughs> I couldn't resist it. You know, I mean, I, I, I grew up, I was lucky to grow up in a place with a lot of access to the outdoors, seven acres of woods and a farm pond and a mother who basically said every day, go outside and find something to do. <laughs> and I never really changed from the kid in Girl Scout shorts with a black eye, you know, swinging on vines and digging holes and starting fires. And <laughs> I care about nature. I find it endlessly fascinating. And, you know, my career didn't start with that. I started at a very small paper out in uh, Maryland, actually, Cops and Courts, classic beginner beat. After that, it was state government for many years, um, covering the legislature and we called the General Assembly back in Maryland and then came out here in 1992. I worked for the Spokesman Review where Karen and I met and I covered the legislature for them. Really, I was a political reporter for many years. Good training for covering the environment. Uh, and then in covered tribes full time for 10 years, which I think in a mainstream paper is pretty unusual. And then in 2015, I got this call. This is how things always happen in newspapers. Uh, hey, would you be willing to? And I was like, sure. So I've, I've been the environment reporter full time since 2015 at the Seattle Times. I've got colleagues who also do that work. Hal Burton does fantastic work. So it's we have a new reporter, uh, Nick Turner, who just started as our climate reporter. Reporter, so I don't do it alone. Heaven knows. Um, but that's how it started. You know, I, I've just been fascinated since my earliest days with nature, how it works, and the beautiful uh, interrelationships between species and processes. It's just endlessly interesting. And to me, the more you know, the more interesting it is. And I, it feels like important service work be telling these stories um, to a mainstream audience so that people who are looking through the paper, maybe to read the sports section and they stumble across something I wrote about nature, tribes, environment, maybe they start reading it and they learn something they didn't know about. That to me is what it's all about. Broadening our understandings with one another and creating community in a, in a safe, inspiring space. And it's one thing to have reporters who are aware and wanting to report on these issues, another to have support from editors, from okay. managers, um, uh, which is also relatively rare. Kara's asking how can managers and news organizations value tribal journalists, and for that matter, um, uh, editors and managers valuing, um, you know, frontline journalism um, right. and community-based journalism instead of just. Uh, being stenographers at the state capitol. Um. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, this, this is essential work, and I think the Seattle Times does a great job of, I know they've supported me all these years, and I'm very grateful for that support. It's not like I have to beat them over the head and say, oh, you have to publish this. Not at all. They, they give these stories uh, front page space and lots of space, and, you know, it is regarded as some of our most important work, so I feel like they get it. Um, I, I do think that we need to be more proactive in, in bringing in native journalists writing these stories. And uh, there are lots of ways we can do that. We can do it through partnerships. We can do it through um, recruitment, of course. And I, I'm, I'm not going to rest on this. I, I really feel like it's just one more thing we need to do for a more accurate report in our paper. It's, it's not, um, it's not an accurate newspaper until it reflects the community that we're reporting on and is written by the people in the community. Well, since it naturally flows off of our conversation about dam removals, I'm wondering if you can address um, 
whole situation with the Chinook and the orcas, especially mm-hmm. the Southern resident orcas, mm-hmm. um, your book, Orca, Shared Waters, Shared Home, was really a distillation of many of your articles. Um, and, and I think some of the poignant stories of Tahlequah, who uh, guarded her her young uh, for so long, for 17 days, um, Tokite or Lolita and the uh, Sea Aquarium, these very moving stories yeah. about our orca neighbors. Um, but what does it say also more broadly about the um, orcas as this indicator species um, that are really pointing the way towards making major changes um, in, a, in particular energy systems? Right. You know, I, I appreciate that. I, I think the reason that we at the paper decided to um, lift up such a large body of work about orcas in 2018, I mean, it, it's interesting. We actually made that decision before Mother Orca Telepa started carrying her calf. We had already decided we were going to take a deep dive, no pun intended, into the orca catastrophe, the salmon catastrophe. We had a new managing editor who came up to me in the newsroom after I'd written story after story about you know, empty nets and test fisheries and changing climate and what that meant for salmon abundance and declining population of orcas. And he came up to me in the newsroom and he said that perfect thing. He said, why don't we connect the dots? I was like, yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Let's do that. And so we decided to do a project uh, about the orcas and the salmon and basically follow the orcas everywhere they went in their migratory range and asked the question, what is the problem? Why are these animals not thriving? And then that same summer, as we're, you know, starting to make our plans and beginning to do research, thinking we're going to, in a bow, tie up a project that will come out in its own tidy way, six months later, something like that, Mother Orca Telepa starts carrying her cat in the Salish Sea for 17 days and a thousand miles, something that scientists had never seen happen before. And, you know, that happened to come at a time when things were pretty chaotic at the paper. A lot of people left one thing or another. I thought, well, you know, that's fine. I'm just going to go out there and, and start covering this. And I'm filing to basically anybody who answers the phone um, about this whale, this mother whale carrying her dead calf. And what in the world? you know, was going on here. She clearly understood that her calf was dead. Her, her whole family was staying with her as she, you know, carried the calf. It was basically this procession of grief. And I'll tell you, uh, by the time she, I won't say she dropped the calf. I think it fell apart. Um, by the time that story ran on paper, which I filed on some Sunday night to like a sports editor, <laughs> six million people were reading that story around the world had been following Mother Orca Telepa. Why was that? Because she was a mother who happened to be a whale. She transformed the conversation about just some random endangered species to families. You know, that these weren't just random black and white wildlife out there. These were families. And they were families that were very close-knit, that never disperse for life, that uh, have language and greeting ceremonies and um, great affection for one another that are highly intelligent. Uh, you know, orcas are among the most intelligent animals on our earth. They're really best considered as an ancient society. You know, Southern resident orca society has been in the Northeastern Pacific for 10,000 years. As a species, orcas have been around for 6 million years. There are many different types of orcas all over our planet, the Southern residents being one ecotype. So this is a miraculous animal. It's unique to our region. They've been around a very long time and they are very closely knit with the ecology of this place. They depend primarily on Chinook salmon for their food because they're the biggest fish and the biggest salmon in the sea, more calories for the hunting effort. You might scratch your head about that and say, why? You know, Chinook are scarce. Uh, Why would such a smart animal target such a rare species, why would it refuse to eat other things like, well, seals, for instance? Because when you're an orca, you are what you eat. These are deeply embedded cultural patterns. Orcas are born on a blank slate, uh, but their mothers teach them what food is. And these are very conservative societies. Uh, Whatever they used to do a generation or two before is what they still do today. And in this way, uh, they have a lot of similarities with the first people of this place. Traditions matter 
and what you were taught is food and where you were taught to gather it, that's where the Southern residents still go. That's why you see a whale like Ocean Sun, L22, still taking her whole family all the way down to Southern, Southern reaches of the coast, all the way down to San Francisco Bay, looking for winter Chinook, going back to the Sacramento River. Are they even getting any fish? You have to ask yourself, or is she just chasing a memory of fish? Why does she do that? Because her grandmother did it before her. These cultural teachings of where the salmon are, the matriarchs, the oldest whales, they're the ones who lead the pods to fish. they will be a mile ahead of all the others looking for the places where they know the fish are, where it used to be. This is where we come in. You know, we, we are capable of making changes like the Elwha Dam removal and so many others that can help these fish runs rebound. And if we don't do that, um, you know, these, these Southern resident orcas will not be long for this place. There are only 73 of them left, 73. You ask yourself, well, wow, that's a small number. Is it really too late? Should we even bother? This is when I look at the Northern residents, the very same animal just up in BC, same obligate salmon eater, same species, just in a different place. You can almost think of them as the control group. And they came back from really tiny numbers after the capture era in the 1970s to rebuild some more than 300 today. And they routinely have young. So what's the difference between the northern residents and the southern residents? The northern residents have much quieter water, less shipping traffic. They have cleaner water less industrial runoff. And they have a greater variety of salmon from which to choose and more salmon. In fact, a lot of the salmon coming out of the Columbia, Snake, Puget Sound rivers, they turn right when they come out to the sea and they head north up to Alaska and beyond. Well, who do you think eats those fish when they're headed back to Washington rivers? The Northern residents. So they're in competition with the Southern residents for their food. But you know, that, Sharing of that space has been going on for thousands of years. So don't blame them. It's about us and what we've done to the abundance of these rivers and the abundance of these fish. Let's look at the Columbia River. Really important food source for the Southern residents. It used to be, of course, the largest salmon producer in the world. The Snake River used to produce 40% of the Chinook coming out of the Columbia, 40%. Today, there, there are tributaries in the Snake River drainages that have five fish coming back, five. You're at a quasi-extinction status on a lot of the drainages in the Snake River. Why is that? Well, you've got eight main stem dams between them and the sea, and you lose a hunk of the run at every single one of those dams. Yes, at each dam, survival is better than it's ever been, but you're still losing like 5% of the run. Well, five times eight is 40. And, by, and that's just before you even get to the sea when everything else happens to these fish. So, you know, this, this, is, this is the problem of our incredibly heavy footprint on these rivers with a dam building campaign that started in the 1900s and didn't stop until really the 1970s. The last dam on the Snake River was built in 1976. So, you know, the orcas really depend on us to rebuild the fish run so they can have the food they need. There are other problems. Climate is up and climate change is upending the chemistry of the seas and even the very food web on which salmon depend. There's just no question that that puts even more pressure on the freshwater environment where we can actually have more control over how we're affecting the productivity of those systems. The effect of climate change on the ocean shouldn't cause people to decide, oh, well, we can't really do anything about that. Anyway, it's all climate, it's all the ocean. Quite the opposite. You know, you talk to the scientists who look at these Snake River populations and how at risk they are. What they say is this is a wake up call about just how important uh, management of these freshwater systems are, really are, because we have to look at these salmon in every life stage. Every life stage. You can't just cherry pick um, and, and do everything we can to ensure their survival. And remember, this isn't like just a nice guy thing to do, it's the law. <laughs> Well, two ways it's the law. It's the law under the Endangered Species Act, and it's the law under the tribal treaties that um, were enacted back at White Settlement. And these are the supreme law of the land. It's right in the Constitution of the United States. And, you know, the ancestors of the tribes that are here today 
reserve these rights to hunt, fish, gather, get the medicinal plants in their traditional territories. So you look at a tribe like the Nez Perce, their traditional use area is way, way, way down the Columbia Basin. You know, vast territory from the mountains all the way into the mid-Columbia area. And this was a seasonal ground that progressed from the lowlands with the arrival of the spring fish further and further and further up into the high country. And, and the idea that um, those fish are no longer there to get or the access to those roots and berries is, is blocked by private property. The idea that these essential first foods and medicines that their ancestors knew they would need to survive the apocalypse of our arrival are not available because of the overdevelopment uh, and one-sided nature of how the treaty uh, right now is not being honored. We got what we signed for, which was vital to these indigenous lands, but we have not kept our part of the bar our, our part of the bargain, which was an abundant ecology under which these reserved rights would be meaningful. So, you know, the Stevens treaties were signed in Washington territory, what would become from Oregon territory, Washington state. They were signed 1854, 1855 in a vast swath of landscape from Flathead territory all the way to Neo Bay, all the way down to what is where you're sitting today at Evergreen. Incredible amount of territory. Uh, and in each one of those treaties, these, these are templates, they're all very similar. That promise was made. So what about those promises? And I think that this is gonna be a very interesting summer for the salmon people. This is gonna be a time when Governor Inslee and Senior Senator Washington, Washington Senior Senator Patty Murray have promised two things. Number one, that there's gonna be a process under which these Snake River dams are analyzed, cost benefit. What would it really mean to take them out? What would it cost? What would it look like? What would you have to do to replace the benefits? With a decision sometime in July, of this year about you know whether that ought to happen, whether that should be recommended policy to be then enacted in legislation. So it, if you care about this topic, now's the time to be paying attention. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. It's it's um, it's been a subject in our region for 25 years, you know, this litigation that's been going on in the federal court for biological opinion of how the rivers run for salmon that's been going on. Uh, for 25 years, the litigants have actually stayed their suit at this time. They've set it aside so the region can actually negotiate what ought to happen. That's a very big good faith gesture. They didn't have to do it, but they did. So it's going to be a big summer for the salmon people all over the region. And, and tribes are united on this question in a way they've never been. You know, the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, the, the Congress of American Indians, they've all come together and called for dam removal on the lower snake. That's never happened before, from the plateau to salt water. Um, that's a first. And also for the first time, the Washington Environmental Council has come out in favor of dam removal on the lower snake and really held it up as a priority for the region. That's never happened before. So it, it is changing times. And I think there's several reasons for that. Climate is demanding it. The just desperate numbers of Salmon returns being so depressed is demanding it. Uh, the treaties are demanding it and people are demanding it. It's a very interesting time in the region. I've been covering this issue since the 1990s and I've never seen so much um, political push behind it by the tribes and uh, the NGOs that are supporting them. Of course, there's just as much pushback in Washington where all four of these dams are located. These are federal dams, so it's a different process. You don't have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission relicensing process. It's forcing an economic analysis. And like these other examples we spoke of early, earlier where industrial owners are just calling the question and saying, I don't even want this thing anymore. Take it off my hands. It's very different. These are federally owned um, and they still work. I mean, you can debate whether the economics of them make sense, but they still run. You know, they're not uh, falling apart the way these other structures I spoke of were the Klamath dams today, the Condit dam, the Watt dam. These things were truly falling apart. The four lower Snake River dams, they're producing power as I sit here. Um, and so 
you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a tougher, harder question. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of invested interests involved who, uh, as recently as these dams were completed, feel quite a sense of entitlement around them. And they do produce significant benefits, transportation, energy production. Um, and so that, that needs to be looked at and needs to be looked at honestly and fairly. Irrigation, I should also mention, there, there are not very many irrigators off the Ice Harbor Pool outside Pasco, but they're very large. And interestingly, a lot of them are owners from outside the region. A lot of that farmland's been bought up by investment trusts like the Canadian Teachers Pension Fund and uh, the Mormon Church owns a vast amount of acreage in the Ice Harbor Pool. And, you know, these, these acreages are, are being managed by outside investors. They're going to have some of the last firm water in the West because it's the Columbia River. So it's, it's regarded as incredibly valuable, almost unique uh, farmland. It's also a place because of the long daylight hours in the summer and the cool, cool night temperatures and hot sunny days, it's just a uniquely special place for agriculture, whether you're growing grapes or carrots. So, um, you know, those users, interestingly, the irrigators have been the first ones to kind of step into the fray and say, okay, change is clearly coming, figure it out. You know, we figure it costs this much to extend our irrigation pipes and fix our pots so we can still farm. Here's your number, you know, pay us. It's very interesting that you have these irrigators stepping forward and saying change is clearly coming, so let's make a deal. Whereas others are still kind of holding back, you know, saying saying that they just oppose making changes in a system that's worked well for them since the 70s, you know. But it it's a it's a different conversation today than I've ever seen it. For those uh, who perhaps joined us late, you can ask a question, a written question in the Q&A if you hit the button at the bottom and uh, we'll pass that on to Linda. You can also raise hand if you wanna ask a question verbally. We've got another half hour or so to one o'clock. We're gonna talk some about forestry, but I wanted to um, kind of touch on that theme of, of tribal powers. Um, the fact that so much damage has been done in some of these watersheds and estuaries from settler colonialism. Susan Holcroft brings up uh, Salilo Falls and the um, uh, flooding in 1957 um, uh, by the Dolls Dolls Dam. Mm -hmm. Um, But on on a smaller scale, some of that damage is being reversed with tribal leadership. Um, The Nisqually watershed the Nisqually tribe being recognized as the lead entity making the plans for the federal, state, and local governments and private landowners to follow. I mean, there's some really unprecedented um, things happening in the Pacific Northwest that offer kind of a glimpse of a possible future Mm -hmm. of tribes being more in the driver's seat in the territories that were ceded to the United States, their ancestral homelands that largely correspond to watersheds. And I'm wondering if you can look forward, if these trends continue, could we see, for instance, a restoration of Silo Falls? Could we see um, local governments turning to tribes as better protectors of their local environments and economies than um, their their own governments? Um, And we see these kind of suggestions around the country, these unlikely alliances and stopping power lines or uh, uh, pipelines and and coal trains. But watershed restoration, dam removal seems to be one of those places that um, the settlers are following indigenous leadership for the first time. Agreed. And in your book about unlikely alliances, um, it does call that out. And it's, you know, we've been seeing this building and building since Standing Rock. Uh, and and before, and it's, I, I think this is not going to get smaller. It's going to get bigger. And there's a couple reasons for that. I think it's partly that the tribes uh, have been rebuilding and diversifying their economies. So they have the capacity for uh, tribal members to come home and work for their tribe as as lawyers, um, as as fisheries experts, as conservation technicians. You know, we're, we're seeing a a dramatic capacity building uh, at the tribal nations, which is in enabling them to not only go toe to toe with um, with states and, and the federal government, but also lead the way. I mean, it's very interesting. If you look at 
the percentage of tribal budgets that go to um, sustaining the natural world and rebuilding it, whether it's in fisheries or estuary recovery or wildlife research. You know, you take a small tribe like Lower Elwha, just to go back to them for a moment, they've got a full-time wildlife biologist on staff. They're, they're doing all kinds of research on everything from cougar populations to, of course, Elwha recovery. And, you know, that's a small tribe out there on, on the Olympic Peninsula. And then you look at some of these really big powerhouse tribes, um, such as Tulalip, you know, they have, they have huge fisheries departments. Um, and there's a reason for that, because they care about it so much, but also because, honestly, they've taken over some of the work from WDFW, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, where funding has not kept pace, either with population growth or the increasingly sophisticated problems that they need to take on. And the tribes have actually been backfilling a lot of what used to be um, state activities, everything from hatcheries, uh, production to wildlife and fisheries monitoring. There are co-managers, of course, of the fishery in Washington, but their their work goes far beyond that. And we're only going to continue to see that, I believe, uh, in terms of tribal leadership, both because of capacity and and desire to be up front and be leading the way. You look at some of the things the Nez Perce tribe has done, for instance, in uh, the Columbia system and the snake you know, they have brought back from extirpation a coho run um, up above Lewiston. And, I mean, it just virtually went away. And they, through their hatchery, have, have restarted a coho run where it was gone. Fall Chinook, a really important fishery in the Columbia system, which sustains, by the way, also a very important um, commercial fishery for non-Indians. That was also boosted by the Nez Perce tribe and their work at their hatchery. They have some of the most successful hatchery returns anywhere in the basin because of innovative practices. And it goes further. They've also been, they and other tribes have been working very hard at re reintroducing and restoring lamprey. And this is a very ancient species. It's one of the oldest species on our earth. Very important to the native ecology and native diet of the Columbia Plateau. Lamprey can't climb fish ladders. At dams. They need to be either rescued, that is to say, picked up and moved, or you can put in little slides for them. There are things you can do, but they can't just like climb a fish ladder. It doesn't work for them. So the Nez Perce tribe has been working with other tribals, tr tribal leaders around the Columbia Basin to rear lamprey in hatchery. I'll tell you, you take the lid off a lamprey tank, it's a sight to see. <laughs> They learned they had to clamp it down. The little lamprey are so powerful, they can like push up the top and escape. That happened. So, you know, this is the kind of leadership that's going on all over the region. It's going beyond salmon to other species. It's going beyond hatcheries to monitoring and evaluation and research. Um, this is something to be very grateful for. It's, it is really uh, helping sustain our natural world. It's I think you could say it's an unfair burden on tribal budgets. I and mean, remember, they do everything for their people, everything from you know, law enforcement to education to health care. So it's a lot to be asking them to be picking up the burden that WDFW, but honestly, they just step in and do it because they care so much. Um, mm -hmm. And then the political leadership has been remarkable. I mean, you look at the voices being raised up. Uh, from Puget Sound country all the way to the Columbia Plateau on behalf of salmon. And then some of the really interesting things that are going on up in the upper Columbia, the upper Columbia United Tribes, they've been, this is fun, they've been replanting salmon above these full blockage dams like Grand Coulee. And having success, you're seeing salmon uh, beginning to show up again in places like the San Poil River, where, you know, they're just completely blocked by the dam to the sea. And I'm very interested in what the long-term strategy is there. What, what's the idea uh, in restarting those salmon runs? One thing's for sure, once, once salmon are there, people will never forget about them. Yeah, there's a question from Cedar Turner. Can hatcheries fully offset the damage to salmon and other fish populations done by dams? <laughs> I wish. I mean, if that were the case, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, right. Washington is one of the biggest hatchery states in the world. Um, in the country, certainly. Look, we've been making fish and hatcheries for more than 100 years, and um, we keep trying to get better at it. 
certainly it's nothing like it used to be when we were just discriminately taking fish from here and putting them there with no respect to where the watershed was supposed to be for that species and thereby um, intermixing the gene pool and destroying the natural resilience within one generation of wild fish. Um, we're, we're not doing anything quite that. <laughs> we don't do anything like that anymore, but still, you know, these hatcheries, every scientist will tell you this, that it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we have rivers such as the Columbia where honestly more than 80% of the fish are hatchery fish. And if you care about orcas, you care about tribal treaty rights, you've got to support hatcheries because otherwise a lot of these places there won't be any salmon because we have so hammered the habitat. Uh, but it's not enough. This hatcheries obviously are not the solution or we wouldn't be where we are with these very, very low returns. Um, several reasons for that. Hatchery fish are not as robust as wild fish. They just don't survive as well. They don't have that natural resilience. They also cause problems. They can bring disease. Uh, they, they infiltrate the same habitat as the wild fish, take over, eat the food, uh, use the spawning areas, so there's competition. So hatcheries, boy, I wish it was that simple. That's been, that's been the wish since the settler colonial apocalypse, right? The idea was it's okay, we can have our cake and eat it too. We can sluice out this entire watershed for mines and cover over the spawning beds. We cut down the forest. We can fish our, to our heart's content with fish wheels. We can, we can farm with irrigation ditches that are on screen. We can, we can do anything we want. We'll still have salmon. We'll just make them ourselves and you know, think of them as farm animals that we could just ranch and raise. And what we know now is that's not true. I mean, salmon need what they need. They need cold, clean, fresh water running downhill. And if they have that, they can do almost anything. If they don't have that, they can't. So. Fish need to be managed uh, for their place rather than the other way around. Place being managed the way we like and the fish can just deal that. We know now that that's, that's not sustainable. That doesn't work. And hatcheries can only support natural recovery. They can't take the place of it. And we're in a place now where many fish runs are so depleted that um, it's all we've got left. And that's not a ticket for the future. We have to rebuild the natural resilience of these watersheds. And the revolutionary implications of having to get everything right in a watershed. And at the same time, the tribal powers resulting mm. in kind of a slow scale decolonization, mm. um, kind of a political and cultural change in the watershed. Um, the implications are really, really enormous. Wanted to um, switch gears to forestry, considering mm. that uh, there's been so much attention. You know, it, it seemed that the spotted owl wars were all in the past, right? Oh. And, uh, and now we have a whole series um, of direct actions here in Capital State Forest, up at Point Renfew on Vancouver Island. Your book, uh, Witness Tree, um, is, is definitely centered on forestry. And your upcoming uh, book that you're working on, Indigenous Ecology and Cultures and Old Growth Forests, wondering if um, you can kind of bring us to the larger implications of some of the forestry conflicts going on right now. Yeah, I, you know, I'm actually heartened by these conflicts. I, I see these as a good and healthy thing. I, I see for the first time in the last couple of years, tree sits in DNR land. That's very new for the State Department of Natural Resources. They really hadn't seen that before. Suddenly at these Board of Natural Resources meetings, you have dozens of people showing up to testify, citizens. They, aren't, they were not used to that. You have citizen-led forestry walks in the Capitol Forest and beyond um, out into very special forests led by citizens concerned for them. That really wasn't going on. Um, I, I think what's happening here is, is we're taking this conversation about forestry to a whole new level in Washington state. It isn't any longer this binary conversation about old growth or plantation lands without any consideration for anything in between. What has emerged as a new uh, point of contention is protection for legacy forests. Well, what are those? These are forests that don't quite meet the template of so-called old growth in our state, which is, it's very uh, numerically scored. It has to, tree has to be a certain age. It has to be of a certain configuration. There, there are various attributes, boxes that have to be ticked for something to be considered old growth and protected under the state old growth policy. Of course, old growth on federal lands has been largely protected since the Northwest Forest Plan was enacted. 
one of the largest, most ambitious multi-species protection plans ever in the world. Uh, but on state lands, uh, what is emerging is a, is a conversation about not just old growth and not just plantation forests, but legacy forests. And a legacy forest is a forest that was cut back in the day, early 1900s, by hand, with a saw and the logs dragged out by oxen. These would have been very sloppy, so-called sloppy clear cuts in which the operators would have high graded the land, really taken the biggest, easiest to get to, Douglas fir and red cedar, and skidded them out, left the rest. Didn't then uh, slash burn everything on the site, didn't then pesticide it, didn't then uh, replant it with a single species. That's the way you go on industrial forest lands. These early cuts were sloppy cuts and gentle cuts. They, they took some wood, but they left a lot. Well, those trees that were left behind today are 140, 160 years old, 110 years old, 90 years old. And they live in a native ecology of a diverse suite of life, lots of different species, deciduous species too, a robust understory, all kinds of wildlife. This has been a century long recovery in some places on these lands. And you know it when you walk on them, they feel like forests because they are. They've regrown to natural forest, legacy forests. And they're highly valued uh, for water quality, for species, for biodiversity, and for human, human sustainability. I mean, just the beauty and benefit of being able to walk in, in a wood in the capital forest that close to a major population settlement and, and be in a natural wood and, and hear the sounds of a natural wood and feel the beauty of being in that forest. Uh, this, as more and more people move to the Northwest, which will be the last nice best place to live as climate change comes, these natural forests are just absolutely critical to human well-being as well as biodiversity and climate management. And so that's the new discussion in Washington state. And it's just started in the last couple of years. It's really revving up. Uh, we've seen a couple of real big surprises just recently with even rural county commissioners in Whatcom County calling on the board of county commissioners to push pause on sale there uh, because of the value of the trees as trees rather than lumber. There's a, there's a, that's a huge shift. We wouldn't have seen that even a couple of years ago. And so what did they do? They, <laughs> they pushed pause to give the, com the community time to buy it. Well, you know, maybe there'll be other solutions down the road. But I think that this new conversation is of what are forests for and how do we value them as a community? These are our public forests. To really think of them as what they actually are, which is clean water utilities and, and species havens and, and places of healing and respite for people rather than just lumber, two by fours, you know? I mean, we have so much land that's already been converted to plantation forestry and clear cuts, including on state land. I am not worried about running out of wood. Nobody should be worried about running out of wood. And this argument that, oh, then you'll just have to get it from places where things are managed even worse. I wouldn't say that's necessarily so, especially if we actually looked at uh, management of the timberlands in Washington state. I mean, the industrial foresters today are um, not being pushed to do anything better than 40 year rotations and shipping whole logs overseas to China to make cement forms. Well, maybe, maybe that could change. I mean, there's the world is, is the community's oyster. The, the community, especially in Washington, a place that has the initiative process can rethink and, and urge and change these policies. And the thing that heartens me is that, you know, it is still the evergreen state. There's a lot left. You come here from anywhere else and you recognize this is still a place of mountains and forests and rivers. It really is. Um, so the question now that's being raised up by concerned community members and tribes is, well, what about these state forests? And there's also a very important suit that's proceeding in the Supreme Court brought by NGOs. And it asks the question, well, you know, if we talk about public benefit, who's the public benefit? Who's the public that's being benefited? Is it really just the beneficiaries of the state trusts, as has always been said by DNR, 
or is it all the people for all time? And wouldn't that bring in climate as a concern for how we manage these forests? Wouldn't it bring in a whole lot of other values? It, there's a decision expected on that any day. And if, if it goes as the NGOs wish, uh, it should help give DNR more tools in their box to manage these forests, not just for the beneficiaries of the trust for cash, but for all these other values. Um, just recently, just last week, uh, State Commissioner of Public Lands Hillary Franz announced a whole new state carbon reserve, something we've never had before, in which um, this would provide a new stream of revenue for the trusts coming from probably large corporations buying offsets uh, from state forest lands. And these would be verified by a third party. It's, a, it's an encouraging step. It's another tool in the box. There was a lot of criticism uh, by people of this saying, oh, well, that's just giving polluters another tool to continue to pollute rather than ending the pollution. Fair enough. Uh, also the concern that it's a tiny amount of forest that right now has been set aside for this purpose, just, you know, tiny, like 0.5% of state lands. Fair enough. You know, these, these, are, these are points to bring forward. Make sure that those offsets really are the real deal, make sure that they're for long periods of time, make sure they're truly additive. Maybe there are more forest lands that could be brought into this uh, state carbon reserve, but it's a new thing. We haven't even had that in Washington state before. And I find that heartening that this step is being taken. Um, so there's a lot going on in, in forest management in Washington state that I think is a good sign. The engagement of the public, paying attention to its state land, showing up at these sales, walking these sales, raising the ruckus. There's, um, there's a whole new attention being paid and that can only be a good thing. And I think as well that some of these new management tools that are coming forward, such as the carbon reserve, that's a good thing. Um, it just always feels like a like not enough, you know, there needs to be more faster, more acres, more tools. Um, and, but I'm, I'm heartened by what I'm seeing. And since we're one ecosystem with the Salish Sea, Pacific Ocean, and one of the other epicenters of uh, forestry activism has always been uh, BC and Vancouver Island in particular, can you, uh, some of your recent articles have, have touched on the pretty complex mm -hmm. uh, situation, the Ferry Creek blockade and the Point Renfrew area, uh, defending some of the last stands uh, that, are, uh, that are there of old growth. Yeah, this, uh, and this really started up about two summers ago. There was actually a, a youth from Washington State uh, matter of fact, right in Union, uh, who, who's one of these people who's really good at reading online maps. And he noticed uh, that there was some road building that was about to start happening in the Ferry Creek drainage. Now, this is a very special watershed right outside of Port Renfrew, which, Sultan, maybe you want to put up a map. I mean, it's it's at the south end of Vancouver Island. It's it's in the same cultural con continuity with the New Chantland people across the water and at Macaw. Um, the city most directly across the water from Port Renfrew is Port Angeles, if that helps locate it for you. So the Ferry Creek drainage, um, it had never been cut. And, and all of a sudden, you know, this, this activist noticed that there was going to be road building in, in the Ferry Creek drainage and kind of sounded the alarm and directed a lot of uh, activist attention to the area. And what started to happen was the placement of blockades, human blockades, uh, on the logging roads to prevent uh, progress of logging equipment and road building into the Ferry Creek drainage. Well, that was in the, in the summer of, of 2020. And, and the activism uh, resulted in, in just hundreds and hundreds of arrests and eventually quite a lot of um, attention around the world, even to what was going on. Because as you said earlier, everyone thought the, the war in the woods was over. And, and indeed here, here were old growth trees threatened with being cut and actively being cut, not only uh, around Ferry Creek, but all over Vancouver Island. These thousand year old trees, 800 year old trees, the kind of trees that everybody kind of had fallen asleep about and thought they were already protected. Not at all. And so, you know, this, this really raised attention to this area and, and people flooded the zone and uh, manned these blockades and uh, staffed these blockades. It was 
very, very hard. The, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, were charged with protecting the loggers and the logging activity. And they, uh, there was a lot of violence with, against the protesters and incredibly no one's been killed. There have certainly been injuries. Um, and, and, you know, fast forward to today, we're, we're going into now a third logging season up there and protesters are definitely intending to go back and, and defend. And I, I don't know what that's going to look like, whether they'll, they'll do encampments again or, or try to move the activism to the urban areas. Um, more eyes, more visibility, less dealing with the RCMP back in the woods. It's, um, we'll see what this year looks like, but certainly no one is giving up on those old growth forests. I, I think that what has to be said is these are vanishingly rare. I mean, these are really the white rhinos of the woods. This is, this is territory that has, has been uncut since forever, basically. I mean, these are the primary forests and there's less than 3% of them left, less than 1% if you're talking about the really prime lowland um, forests. This is a very special band of forests that basically runs from Southeast Alaska all the way along the coast to uh, Northern California. And if you look at how much of that has already been cut, it's, um, it's significant. I mean, there's very little of that left. And any climate scientist would tell you that uh, it's not defensible to cut those forests today, that nobody anywhere should be cutting those forests. It's just the climate emergency is so severe and, and these forests are so important in dampening the worst effects of climate change because of the carbon dioxide they take out of the air, um, the way they protect water, the way they, they moderate temperature, the way they shelter biodiversity. These, these are the last of the last that can't be replaced in any human lifetime or many human lifetimes. And so, they just shouldn't be touched. And if you talk to carbon scientists like Beverly Law at Oregon State University, if you talk to Jerry Franklin, uh, the eminent scientist from Washington, University of Washington, and also the US Forest Service, you know, they'll tell you the same thing, that these old growth majestic forests should be left to stand for all time. And they would even say that these older legacy forests, these you know, 100 year old forests, west side moist forests that aren't gonna burn, that if left alone can clock on into an eighth century, they should be left to, to become the old growth of tomorrow. But it's not a simple story. You know, the, I focused on the Pachidot Nation, which um, has the unceded territory throughout the Ferry Creek area. You know, it's in Canada, as, as troublesome and troubling as the treaty making time in, in the United States is and was, in Canada, um, a lot is even worse in the sense that treaties have not been made and you have uh, First Nations there never fought a war and never signed a treaty and are just watching their resources be um, extracted on so-called crown lands. And this is true for the Pachidot Nation. This is a very small nation, about 300 people out in the Port Renfrew area. And they, for 100, 150 years, have watched their forests leave on logging trucks uh, for everyone else. And BC uh, very strategically, I believe, has, has placed the Pachidot and other First Nations right in the middle of this old growth fight by saying, yeah, we'll do deferrals, not necessarily long-term protection, but deferrals on these old growth lands if the First Nations agree. But without providing uh, monetary support for those nations that really really rely on and need uh, the logging revenues. Let's focus for a moment on the Pachidot Nation. They, for the first time, have their own sawmill. Uh, they've never had their own mill in town, and it enables them to do value-added production of old growth logs that uh, come out of their unceded territory. This is the only thing that's economically viable by way of timber uh, in timber production in their neck of the woods, because they are in a very isolated place. There's not a lot of um, mill, milling infrastructure around them and so forth. So the only thing that really makes it um, monetarily viable for them is to cut old growth and mill old growth. And that's what they're doing. And they have for the first time jobs for people to come back to at the reserve. They're using logging revenues um, to diversify their economy. They have their first store, their first gas station. They're uh, investing in tourism in their region. 
and they're doing all this with logging revenues uh, in a place where trees and the sea have always been where they make their money. And so, you know, it's, it's very difficult to watch this playing out in, in the way that it is right now. There's a, an elder from Pachidot who has really taken up the old growth defense cause and he's very isolated in the community. Um, but nonetheless, he's still standing firm and saying he doesn't want to see any more old growth in their unseated territory cut, no matter who's cutting it, whether it's Pachidot on their, in their um, enterprises under these new more lucrative contracts that BC is starting to provide for logging, suddenly not just beads and blankets, as their forestry manager told me, but 50-50 revenue splits if you cut the trees, uh, but no financial support so far if you decide to defer cutting. So it's very complex. It's, uh, it's, it's an absolutely front lines battle for the First Nation that has, sees its own sovereignty and its own economic survival on the line. It's a very front lines fight for the defenders who have come into the territory um, at the request of Elder Bill to um, you know, stand up for those last stands. So you'll see more of that this summer. And honestly, I, I wouldn't be able to say how it's gonna come out. There's, there's been a surprising, maybe not surprising dearth of good science, even as basic a question as how much old growth is left and how do you define it? Uh, BC has not answered that question particularly well. There's, there, there are finally some published scientific papers on that point, which I relied on in my reporting. Um, but it's this whole conversation is it just feels so late in the game. I mean, here in Washington State, here in the United States, um, even we don't cut a thousand year old trees anymore. Uh, you know, BC in many ways, they call themselves the beautiful natural British Columbia. But if you look at industrial fish farming, you look at cutting of old growth, you look at twinning the Trans Mountain Pipeline tar sands oil uh, right through Orca Habitat, pushing to build a whole new container ship terminal there at the mouth of the Fraser River, right where orcas hunt. You know, there's, there's a lot going on up there that's very, very um, important and impactful to the First Nations, but also to the tribes in Washington state and their treaty rights and all of, all of the beings that depend on the Salish Sea and, and the salmon forests, which is what we should call them. These are salmon forests. They are the forests that hold the land and clean the water and cool the temperatures. And the salmon feed the forests and the forests protect the salmon. And so, you know, it's a lot. It's right across the border. It's, uh, it's happening right now. I was just up there last week in Vancouver oh. at a rally against the Trans Mountain Pipeline on the Fraser <laughs> River, and I concur. And Miranda has been uh, dropping in uh, some great links. Um, we've got maybe just uh, one minute. People could drop their appreciation into the chat for uh, Linda Mapes, and I put a link to her website, uh, lindavmapes.com, uh, Linda with a Y. And um, uh, Carolyn Prouty on our faculty uh uh, as she will, uh, ask a, a kind of a summative question. What have you learned about what makes for the most effective citizen involvement in environmental policy change? What recommendations do you have for political organizing, who to work with, how to work against it? A lot of your answers have implicitly already answered this, but maybe just one minute you could sum up some of the lessons that we should take away from your body of work. For sure. I, I think number one is partnership with the indigenous nations uh, wherever you are, because uh, that, that will amplify and elevate uh, their leadership and what they have to say, and also enable you to uh, amplify and elevate the ancestral teachings and knowledge of those, of those voices. And it, it also, um, it's community building. You know, we, this is work for everyone and it should be done together. So number one, seek out, partner, and offer assistance to whatever indigenous-led um, movements are going on with the, with the tribal governments in your, in your area. That's number one. Number two, educate yourself. Um, read voraciously. Read the newspapers. Um, read books. Educate yourself about what is going on with climate, with species, with, with our world. And number three, this sounds so simple, but People don't necessarily believe it, but it's really true. If you actually write a real letter 
with a stamp with your own hand on a piece of paper that you wrote yourself to your elected representative, Governor Jay Inslee, Maria Cantwell, uh, Patty Murray, your state representatives, they will actually notice that. They're not going to notice a robo postcard. They're not really going to notice um, any kind of mass communication, but something you actually put your heart and your time into, bothered to look up their address and put it in the mail with a stamp. I mean, you get a letter today, a real letter, you think maybe somebody died, right? It's a big deal. You actually really notice that personal communication. Well, it is the same for them. A thousand years ago, I worked in a congressional office and one of my jobs was to um, manage the constituent mail. And I'll tell you something, you get a real letter from a real person who took the time to write it from their home to, uh, to you, you notice it. So do that. If you care about these things, say so and say it to the people making the decisions in your behalf. Well, to clear up any confusion, I put in the chat a link to envelopes.com so people um, can actually know what those look like and uh, you can get a stamp from the post office. So um, thank you so much, uh, Linda, Linda Mapes, for joining us at Evergreen uh, and for providing what there's often a dearth of in both environmental and climate discourse, and that is a sense of hope and of success stories um, in people, communities joining together. Uh, to restore habitat and uh, and actually start the process of decolonization on the ground. So thank you so right. much. And we hope to have you in person at Evergreen sometime in the relatively near future. It'll come. And recolonizing these habitats with the animals that are supposed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to everyone joining us. Mm -hmm.